Hello, and welcome back to Medical Compliance with Clarissa. I'm Clarissa Benfield, our Global Director of our Medical and Laboratory Business Line here at Intertech. And today I am so thrilled to be joined by Alex Porter, who's our Global Director of Engineering. Alex, thank you so much for joining me today. Not a problem. Thank you for having me. Yes, super excited to have you here to talk about all things performance and all of your specialties of expertise. Um, But maybe it would give us a good idea if you just got started by sharing a little bit about yourself, uh, what you do for us here at Intertech, and how you got specifically into the performance space. Uh, Sure. Uh, So Alex Porter, I'm the Global Director of Engineering. I've been with Intertech for 30 years. (laughs) <laughs> and over that time, I've done everything from materials testing to failure analysis, vibration testing. I've developed test methods for accelerated testing, uh, which is a type of performance testing. Uh, and right now, as a global director of engineering with the chief engineering team, we do a lot of technical oversight, business development, uh, help the labs be ready to take on pretty much anything that comes our way. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about performance testing today, especially as it relates to medical devices. Obviously, we work in a lot of different capacities in terms of performance testing. And I think it can be maybe a little bit of a misnomer and overstep when you say performing performance testing, right? Because it's just such yeah. a generic term. Um, but like in practice, when we say we're looking at performance or conducting performance testing, what does that really mean? Yeah, that's a great question because people say performance. And they mean all sorts of different things, but we can break it down a couple of ways. One is performance testing is really how well something works. Now, when you say, well, how well, <laughs> well, that depends on the product, right? So it could be how strong it is or how fast it is, how efficient it is, or it could be how easy it is to hold or, or use. Um, it could be how long it lasts under harsh conditions. Uh, so if you think about that, how fast it is, how strong it is, how well it works, where you can use it. Uh, Those are all performance things. I always like to think of a car, right? You know, how well does a car perform? It's how fast it can go, Mm -hmm. how fast it can accelerate, stop, how well it does in a crash, right? Those are all performance things. And uh, we apply those to pretty much everything. So performance is those parameters, how fast, how strong, and how long it'll last. Yeah, and I think, you know, with medical space specifically, too, now that we're seeing this really big uh, push and trend and the evolution in healthcare that we're seeing this move towards home devices, those things become even more important, right? Because now you're going outside of this traditional controlled environment where we know what its surroundings are going to be. Now you take it into a home environment where there can be children and pets and elderly people using them, right? So performance becomes even more important because now you have the general public who is using medical devices as part of their day-to-day. Yeah. So are they in an air-conditioned home or does it get hot? Is it is it dropped? Uh, is it, it Does the kids play with it? And is it going to function the way we intend to? Um, and how long is it going to last, right? Mm-hmm. If it's in the home for several years, will it still be working the way we intend it to? And all of those things are performance related. Yeah. And of course, that's so important to medical device manufacturers, right? For these home use devices, if you say, oh, someone's going to be prescribed to use this at home for six months or a year or indefinitely, right, the rest of their lives, right? You have to then be sure from a performance standpoint that it can withstand all of those kind of environmental conditions that are outside of your control. Absolutely. Absolutely. So when we think about performance testing, right, what are some of the benefits of doing performance testing? Obviously, it can have, you know, quite an impact on the design and, you know, the success of a device and a new medical device when it's entering the market. But what are the real benefits of doing performance testing? Well, there's some of the obvious ones, right? Is it strong enough? Uh, Is it going to run run fast enough or efficient enough? Mm -hmm. Uh, But some of them can get very basic, like, can this design even function the way we intended? Uh, another one is we're often making products out of components that come from other vendors. Mm-hmm. So which vendor is the best uh, <laughs> for the parameters that I care about? So doing comparison testing, using performance testing to choose vendors, uh, to compare designs, to decide, well, which of these two designs is going to be the better option here? Uh, eat more uh, able to meet all those conditions uh, with less challenges. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are all ways that we can get benefit from that. So making engineering decisions 
And that's really what performance testing is designed to do. Produce information so we can make engineering and business decisions or validate you know, mm-hmm. that we made the right decisions. And in some cases, it's about producing information that we can provide to the regulators or the consumer to say, this is what it does and this is how well it works. Um, so there's a lot that can be done there. So when we're looking at you know performance as it relates to this overall design and development cycle, then are we thinking that we should start performance testing early on, you know, at the design phases, like very early on at a conceptual phase or once prototypes are ready? Like, how do you work performance testing into your overall design process? Uh, absolutely. It's a great question because oftentimes we're thinking, oh, I'm just going to do it at the end and validate <laughs> right? everything. But really, we can do performance testing to answer different questions all the way back, even at the conceptual stage. Mm -hmm. Most companies are not making a brand new product. They're making an evolution of a product. And so you can take an existing design, you can bench modify it a little bit with some ideas for the new design, and then do some checks using performance testing to find out how strong is that gonna be? Is it gonna function the way we want? And how does it fail? That's often (laughs) really useful early on. Um, so that can be at at that early stage, and then you get into doing design iterations. And as I mentioned, you could compare different designs, see which ones are going to work. And then mm-hmm. as you move into your into your production phase to validate your production is producing the same quality part that uh, that you had early. Um, and then even after production, you're getting field returns. What happened to this? How does it behave? Um, did we have a failure in the field or a complaint in the field? Mm-hmm. Can we reproduce that in the lab and get the same performance that they described in their failure? So all the way through from earliest concept uh, into, uh, you know, really uh, deployment in the field, we can use performance testing to answer engineering and business questions. Yeah, and I want to talk about that a little bit more because obviously, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense in the beginning, as you said, right, from an early concept that you can start doing performance testing to do all of your due diligence and make sure your product is set up to succeed. But then we have these failures in the field, right? When we think about, okay, how can we then use performance as this, you know, diagnostic tool when we're having repeated failures or similar failures in the field? And as you say, you know, how do we then take that back, replicate those failures in the lab, and then use that information to iterate and make the product better. Uh, Absolutely. And one of the biggest challenges sometimes with products is producing in the lab the same failure the customer experienced. Uh, Doing failure analysis and combining that with performance testing is an excellent way to figure that out. And some of the performance testing where we take a product beyond its service conditions, the accelerated testing, where we deliberately function the product until it breaks to see how it failed, and to see if we can produce the same failure modes that had occurred in the field. If I have that test, especially an accelerated test, now I have a tool that I can very quickly check uh, a a fix to that. What Mm -hmm. can I do to iterate that design? And of course, I can use those same things earlier in the design process to hopefully avoid the failure altogether. Yeah, right, absolutely. And I think, you know, the idea of looking at the accelerated testing as well makes such a big difference, right? So to your point, okay, can we set up some sort of accelerated performance testing to show, okay, if we say, you know, this is the service life or this is the lifespan of a product, and now we're going to try to accelerate and hit some failure that provides a lot of, you know, good detail and good information back that then you can use to make engineering and design decisions. Absolutely. You can, you can change a design based on how it failed a lot easier (laughs) than you can change the design on how it never failed, right? Failures are actually very useful early (laughs) in the development process. Yeah, and I think that's that's interesting too, right? Because you talk about in most cases when we see development of devices, it's a new version of a similar technology or a new version of a similar device. So then how can we use, you know, some of these performance tests or, you know, performance mistakes that we're seeing or mishaps that we're seeing to then plan for the future? Like how do you take that and say, okay, you know, these are the most common things that we see and then we can translate that into future design and development? Absolutely. So what you can do is take a look at the failures that occurred. You take a look at what the root cause of that was. What is the source of damage that precipitated that failure? And early on, on the next design cycle, make sure that we're exposing the design to those sources of damage, accelerated tests, take the product to failure, reproduce the failure, validate that your design iteration 
is not including that failure mode that's sensitive to those stresses. This can allow you to have continuous improvement on a design so that your product gets better. Well, and so let's say, you know, I'm a manufacturer and I want to set up some of these accelerated testing or I'm having issues with failure in the field. How does that work in practice, right? Do I give one sample? Do I give 10 samples? <laughs> How do you really look at it and say, okay, you know, we need to replicate this one time. We need to replicate it 10 times. Like, how, how do we look at it when we're actually doing the testing? Yeah, that's a great question. And it depends a lot on what information we're trying to get. So, for instance, if I'm trying to demonstrate a given reliability, I'm going to have to have a set of samples and do a reliability test. On the other hand, if I'm trying to find a failure mode, um, I can use fewer samples. I might be able to use three or four samples, do an accelerated test of failure, and find specific, um, you know, specific failure modes for the product. So I'll need to, though, provide information to a, a test lab on mm -hmm. what are the what are kind of information am I looking for? What are the sources of damage? How do I expect this product to be used? And what are some of the expected limits on how well this product <laughs> can handle extreme conditions? From that, a test lab can help design a test that would find that information you're looking for, the reliability number you want, the, the failure modes you want to uncover, uh, and then use that information to you know, design the test and tell you, all right, how many samples do we need? And how we how can we manage that time and cost of the test to get the information as efficiently as possible? Yeah, and there's a couple of things you touched on there that I think are interesting to talk about, right? So it's the what, you know, what is expected from a manufacturer, what kind of support is needed on both sides, right? Because I think it's an interesting approach with this type of performance testing or failure analysis to say, okay, maybe I have an idea of what I'm trying to get to, but I need support from the test lab to help me kind of firm up my idea or really narrow in on what exactly the failures are, how we're going to replicate this or how we're going to put together a test plan. So it sounds like, right, it's a, a pretty collaborative process between both sides where it's like, you know, this is what we think we're seeing in the field, or this is the feedback that we're getting from our users versus, okay, this is what we see on the test lab side. This is a common occurrence. Let's bring those two together and then decide on, on the best path forward. Absolutely. And you think about it, the, the manufacturer is the expert on their product, mm -hmm. not the test lab. But the test lab is an expert on how to test it, how to check its reliability, how to check its durability, and to find that information. Uh, the other thing you mentioned, the, you know, the consumer experience uh, or the experience in the field, how a consumer expresses their view of a failure is very different than mm -hmm. how a design engineer would view that and is different than how a test engineer would view that. So that collaborative process can kind of help bridge that gap and say, oh, you know, it 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 stopped working. Well, okay, well, how, right? Yeah. And a design engineer might look at it and say, well, the, the clip was too weak and the test engineer said, well, the force was too strong. <laughs> so having that collaborative uh, interaction is really important to determine what is it you're trying to learn? What are the sources of damage? And how can we control the test and expose the product to those conditions to precipitate those failures and get you the information you need so that you can make good decisions? Everyone can design a great product if they have the right information. Yeah. And that's the key. And I think it's so true what you said right now. Not only do we have to think of the user as a patient, but also as a consumer, right? Because mm -hmm. now in this in this new age where everyone can write a review, write comment on what they think, especially when you're getting these devices that are more portable in home use, people will have their opinions that performance and it it might not be a you know a failure necessarily, but it's it doesn't perform in a way that I think that it should as a person who's using this device, right? So I'm gonna have one opinion versus the test engineer as you said or versus the manufacturer. Absolutely. And it's interesting sometimes the the things that consumers come up with as the key point they think is mm -hmm. important. Now Hopefully it's because we've taken care of the majority of things, but they come up with something else and say, you know, I couldn't quite reach this button or, you know, the cord was too short or, um, you know, it tipped over too easy or at least, <laughs> right? right? Um, and, and those can be things that we don't always see, especially if you're in the middle of making the thing do its primary function mm -hmm. and the consumer is seeing everything else. And that's where uh, getting an idea of what that end use condition is, exposing the product to it. And then looking at anything that is not 
the core function and saying this is uh, it's an observation and figure it out later if it's a failure. But this is doing something you did not expect. Why yeah. is that a failure? What is what is that going to mean in the field? The other thing you touched on, too, with this collaborative process and working back and forth between the manufacturer and the test lab is timelines. So let's talk a little bit about what timelines might look like. Let's say yeah. I'm wanting to do performance testing up front during my iterative design process versus I'm wanting to do failure analysis at the back end when we're already having you know issues in the field or things coming back from the users of our products. Yeah, so early on, what you can do, especially for the uh, finding failure modes on a product doing accelerated testing, uh, you have a collaborative interaction with the test lab to define what sources of damage matter, what you mean by failure, what you mean by functioning or working, uh, and that that can take sometimes a couple of meetings, uh, maybe a week or so to get a really good quote uh, and a test plan put in place. Uh, then you send in samples. It's usually a, a week or so to set up. And then for an accelerated test, it might be one or two weeks to get uh, the result. For a reliability test, that can take longer, uh, depending on the you know what functioning means for the product. There are some products that we it takes some time. Uh, and can even be months to do those, uh, where most accelerated tests can be a couple of weeks and can get you information very quickly. Yeah, is, the, is there a benefit as the manufacturer to to uh, being on site or participating in that, or is it you know can we record how the testing yeah. is going so they can see how it's actually you know performing under those failure analysis or performance type tests? Absolutely, um, being on site or virtually on site are both very helpful especially because the whole reason for doing an accelerated test is to find out how it's going to fail, especially the non-intuitive, unexpected thing. Mm -hmm. So having the person who's involved with the design able to see what happened, better yet, see it as it happened. <laughs> right. So they can say, oh, my goodness, what in the world just happened? Oh, I think I know what happened. Let's try this. Mm -hmm. Right. And that that's really one of the benefits of an accelerated test is then then to be able to explore all right, we think this is what happened. Let's let's go back and change it a little bit. Let's try that again. Uh, let's change the stress a little bit, or we're going to configure the product a little bit different and see if we can eliminate that failure. Okay, now we know that's what caused that. And we actually check maybe even a correction right away. And that kind of interaction, that real-time interaction on an accelerated test can hugely benefit the manufacturer because then even before the reports come out, they have an idea of what's going on and what to do to fix it. <laughs> yeah, right. It them, you know, iterate very quickly. Yeah. So you've obviously you've done a lot of this for a really long time. You've seen a lot of different things. You've written test protocols, as you said. Are there common things that you see or things that would be surprising that people find when they're doing these types of tests? Um, yeah, there are some common things, and you know, uh, intermittent connections on electrical devices is common. Unfortunately, that's something that anyone who's been in the industry for a while knows, right? Connectors, uh, interfaces between products, they tend to fail. But the other thing that shows up is the non-intuitive failure where uh, two different disciplines interact, right? So we have fluid flow or we have electrical and they have to interact together. It's two different disciplines. One person's owning you know, mm -hmm. the, the hydraulics, one person's only electrical, but the two have to work together the two systems might work separately, but then you interact them and interesting things can happen. Uh, the other things that can happen is if you have a product that's primarily electrical uh, or digital, uh, the digital part all works great, but it still has to have a power unit. It still has to have a mechanical case that holds it. And so you'll have really good engineering and thought on the electronic, the digital side, but the other two get a little bit, uh, you know, oh, that must be easy, right? Because that's not my discipline. And so it'll be, that'll be where we'll see challenges in that design. Um, and that's where a testing can show that up pretty quickly. Uh, the other one is if you have a product that's being put together and there are a couple of different major vendors, right? So it's a couple of different technologies that are being put together. The boundaries is where we often see those because there's not a person that owns it. It's kind of the team and each one has their different piece and now they all have to work together. That kind of system level interaction is really useful to go through testing and find that thing that, that really no one person has the expertise to see during the design phase. 
Yeah, and I think that one's such an interesting one just with everything we've seen over the past couple of years with COVID and supply chain issues and people swapping out components or having to go back and make changes in their design that they weren't expecting to or maybe select vendors that weren't their top choice because they need they need those components, right? And then once you start integrating them together, maybe it's not going to perform in the way that you anticipate it would or that you want it to. Yeah. And then the other one is where we're adding in things to technologies, to devices that they didn't go together before, right? Um, So suddenly we're adding in this other feature and everything else works, but now you've added UV light or you've added ozone, or if you added something else that suddenly it's changing how the things are behaving and what worked before suddenly isn't behaving exactly the way it was before. And there's no experience space. Um, And this is one of the areas we mentioned product that carries over, right? And so that that provides uh, uh, some opportunity. But one of the areas that performance testing can help a lot is when we're dealing with something that really is new uh, and it just there is no history in the field and doing some performance testing very early and breaking that product deliberately can be very helpful in getting you an idea of this space. Right. What's happening with this product um, that we've never had in the field and we don't know how it's going to fail. So here we go. Let's break it. Find out. Yeah. I don't know what to expect since it's Mm -hmm. new. Yeah quite interesting. Well, Alex, this is such a great conversation. I love talking about performance testing. Is there anything you want to leave everybody with just in terms of the importance of doing performance testing or the number one reason why you would tell people to do performance testing? Why would we be big advocates for it? Uh, you only want one? <laughs> oh, you can give me as many as you want. <laughs> I'll do, I'll do. The, main, the main thing is there's always a piece of information that you're assuming is true and a performance test can help you validate that that information is indeed true or that there's something else out there. If you know what information you need to make good engineering and business decisions, then we can make a performance test that will get you that information. Well, Alex, that was perfect. Great suggestions and advice for everybody out there. Uh, If anyone has questions, they can feel free to reach out to me directly. We'll get those over to Alex and get answers back to y'all. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Alex, for your time. Great conversation. Yeah, thank you for having me.